Okay, we are continuing this topic, the Son of God, Sons of God, and um, largely following the argument of Graham Goldsworthy in this book, The Son of God and the New Creation. Last week we looked at um, how this theme of the Son of God begins to develop in the Old Testament. We looked first at Adam. Um, and Luke is really the first reference to Adam as Son of God, but we can understand him to be Son of God um, because of his creation by God and the... Um, charge that he was given as God's vice regent, you know, to take dominion. Um, we later see uh, in the development of this theme of the Son of God um, in Exodus 4.22, a reference uh, where Moses um, is being prepared to go to Pharaoh and um, demand that um, God's people be released, Israel is referred to as my son. And so we go from Adam to Israel. We're going to focus um, today on how, the, how that theme is unpacked by uh, the prophets, and then how does how the New Testament um, treats this, or, or how this title "Son of God" is is dealt with in the New Testament. In your outline, um, I've given you. Um, Basically, Goldsworthy goes through, every, I believe it's every verse in Matthew that has a reference to the Son of God. He does an overview of Mark, Luke, and Acts, and you know how these, um, well, um, the Gospels of Mark and Luke, and, and then Acts written by Luke, how they uh, understand the Son of God title, the Son of God in John, you'll see there on the outline, the Son of God in Paul, the Son of God in Hebrews, and we don't have time to go through every single one of these, um, but I, I've included there a, a just Goldsworthy's own summary of uh, what he understands from looking at every one of these passages. And... Um, it's largely in agreement with the, what we dealt with last week uh, briefly in talking about comparing the Son of God versus Son of Man and what, what do these two things mean. Um, so looking at the summary of, of Matthew, for example, there, the evidence from Matthew does not primarily refer to the idea that Son of God speaks of the deity of Jesus. It is far more likely that Matthew reflects the Old Testament antecedents in which the title expresses a special relationship between God and his chosen people, Israel, a relationship that came to focus on David and his promised son. The summary of Mark and Luke. Mark shares the overall perspective of Matthew on Jesus as son of God. Luke wants us to know that Jesus, as the Son of God, is the descendant of Israel, who in turn is the descendant of Adam, the first Son of God. The Son of God in John. John, more clearly than the other gospel writers, looks both ways, back into Israel's history and upward to the one sent from above. In this sense, he is more he is the more advanced systematic theologian in making it inescapable that Jesus is both God and man. Son of God and Paul, the linking of the resurrection of Jesus to the covenant with David and the promises made to Israel do not support the popular view that the resurrection of Jesus proves his deity. 
That should rattle your cage a little. It did mine. Uh, we're going to unpack that a good bit today. Uh, the evidence is the other way. It shows that Jesus, the Son of God, had a human lineage as the Son of David. And then Hebrews, Hebrews thus illustrates the important fact that though we can distinguish the divine and human in Jesus, the God-man is such that we cannot separate the two natures. The underlying nature of the person of Christ is a union of God and man without fusion and distinction without separation. So the way that uh, Goldsworthy structures his, his argument in this book, he starts out by this, this, this overview of basically every passage in the New Testament that speaks of the Son of God, looks at the context of how it's being used and, and, and comes to these conclusions. Um, then he goes to the Old Testament, and that's where we spent last week, largely, um, looking at the antecedents um, that the New Testament writers are referencing uh, to, to understand the, the use of that title in, in the Old Testament. And then he comes back to the New Testament, and uh, this item two on this outline, the Son of God and Sons of God, um, and he looks... Uh, very carefully at um, there are different I think five passages that he 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 breaks down we're going to look primarily at Romans 1 3 and 4 and then spend a little bit of time on um, Galatians 4 4 to 7 um, I wanted to t take just a, a few minutes, though, to start out with um, Matthew. So, in, I think, yeah, so it's the first reference uh, it, that Goldsworthy deals with in Matthew is, is verse 2.15. And in 2.15, we have this. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. So Matthew here is quoting Hosea 11.1 1, when he says, spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Well, Hosea 11.1 1 says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So Hosea's reference is, is he's using the same language that Moses was, was using in Exodus 4, 22 and 23. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my people go that he may serve me. And so, it, it was, so we're, we're talking about biblical theology and the way that... Um, we see types and patterns uh, in the way that God interacts with his people. Um, and this is a, 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 an amazing example of um, how the, the writers of scripture are um, inspired by the Spirit, working this out for us to be able to see. There's a, 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 a I guess there are, there are a number of, you know, commentators who, who think that um, Matthew is just misusing Hosea 11.1 1, because Hosea 11.1 1 is a reference to Israel and not a reference Matthew's using it as a reference to Christ, um, but um, you know it's quite dangerous place to be to say Matthew got this wrong. You know, um, you're, you're you're basically beginning with the argument that you can't rely on the Word of God, um, and so you don't 
you, you don't let your uh, uh, limited um, uh, brain capacity um, determine how you're supposed to understand the word of God. You give God credit for having more sense than you do. Um, I was I was thinking about this is this is the I was thinking about the difference between being ignorant and being stupid. Um, being ignorant is having having the brain power but not having the information, and being stupid is not having the brain power. I'm not sure where that falls exactly on. Um, the people who argue that Matthew got it wrong, but um, so so there's this great essay. This is written by uh, Bruce Bigham just in December um, that uh, I found on the um, Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary blog. Did Matthew twist Scripture? examining Matthew's use of the Old Testament. And I'll post a link to this in uh, the Sunday School channel so that you can read it, and you should, because it's really helpful to get a picture of what, you know, what, what are we doing when we're looking at biblical theology. Um, and also just... The, the uh, uh, amazing wisdom of God and the way that he has unfolded history. But I'm going to read you just a little bit about what, what uh, is it, uh, Bigham says about Matthew's use of 2.15. Um, and th so this is like a 16-page article, and, and I, I'm just going to read a short part of it. it it'll kind of give you a, f a sense of uh, um, the, the broader argument. I encourage you to read the whole thing. But it says, Matthew's citation of Hosea 11.1 1 is surrounded by allusions to other pertinent Old Testament passages that are not indicated by the to-fulfill formula. The deliverance from a massacre of infants ordered by an evil king will sound familiar to readers of the infancy narrative of Moses, who was also delivered from infanticide. So you remember, uh, out of Egypt, I called my son. Christ has been taken to Egypt by Joseph, escaping the slaughter of the infants. Well, there was a slaughter of the infants uh, uh, at Moses' time. I, I've just got to take this one little aside. Um, in the British Museum uh, in London, there is an obelisk that was commissioned by the daughter of Pharaoh who raised Moses. Her name is on it. Um, which is it's one of many things in the British Museum that um, Peter Masters wrote about in his book, A Heritage of Evidence. Uh, but it just is like bone chilling in a way to stand there and look at this thing and think, wow, this, you know, Moses, like what, stepmother um, was responsible for that. Um, the other thing that's interesting about it is that her name was they tried to like scratch her name off of it um, after they recognized you know who Moses was and what he had done and and her involvement in it but so um, so in in Matthew two twenty when Joseph is visited again by a, in a dream by an angel, he is told to take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who sought the child's life are dead. That last phrase, for those who sought the child's life are dead, is the same word spoken to Moses in Midian when the Lord tells him to go back to Egypt, quote, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. 
So there's that parallel. The dream vision, which instructs Joseph to go to Egypt for a time and then to come back again, is reminiscent of the visions in the night of the patriarch Jacob, in which God tells him, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will bring you up again. Furthermore, the instructions given to Moses to tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son, Exodus 4.22, is the source for Hosea's reference to Israel as God's son in Hosea 11.1. 1. Out of Egypt I call my son, which is directly cited by Matthew and applied to Jesus Christ. In light of these allusions surrounding Matthew 2.15, one can certainly make the case that Matthew is setting forth Christ as the antitype of Moses, as the representative ruler of Israel, the one who will lead his people from captivity. In this way, he is put forward as the very fulfillment of Israel's history. Matthew indicates this by citation of Hosea 11.1. 1. Jesus Christ is Israel God's son. Um, it's 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 amazing. Um, one of the one of the studies that um, Goldsworthy cites is this article: uh, "Antecedents of the Christian Hope of Resurrection." Um, it's in a footnote. You should always read the footnotes. Um, Anth Anthony Pedersen, I guess it is, is an Australian um, professor, former pastor at, I can't remember, one of the theological schools in, in Australia. And it's just fascinating. He, he traces the development of the theme of resurrection in the Old Testament. So it's antecedents of the Christian hope of resurrection in the Old Testament. And what was really um, kind of startling um, to me and looking at this, like we, we, so, you know, we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ because we have the account of it in, in the New Testament. And uh, we know that there were hundreds of eyewitnesses and the spirit of God has given us the capacity to understand and believe these truths. Um, but it wasn't all that clear to the, to the Old Testament writers. It, I think in one thing I read of R.C. Sproul's, he just said, you know, the doctrine of the resurrection is not clearly laid out in the Old Testament. But, but there are interesting antecedents, things that point to um, um, the, the, there was an understanding uh, within the Jewish community of, of the reality of resurrection, even though uh, it wasn't written clearly ab about. Um, and so this, this study s sort of unpacks the, the understanding um, as it developed in... in in the Old Testament. And that's part of what um, Goldsworthy points to when he's helping us to understand Romans 1, um, 3, and 4. So let's look at that. Romans, he titles this section, uh, Sons of God and the Resurrection. Um, We'll read Romans 1, 1 to, 1 to 4. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, 
and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. I should have gone back and listened to uh, Pastor Mark's, how many sermons on this? <laughs> um, Um, but so Goldsworthy is 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 uh, like focused. On, I don't know, fifteen or twenty pages of this book on verse four, declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. So, the you know the he's declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection. So what does that mean? Why is that important to us? Um, what is Paul saying? And so as, as Goldsworthy begins to unpack this question, you know, the answer to this question, he says, as, as I alluded to earlier, it would be easy to conclude that the resurrection shows Jesus to be God. But that would be to misunderstand what the apostle is saying. So he's not saying that it's wrong. He's just saying this is not the, the, the primary point that Paul is making here in this verse. Paul has already told us that the son is the descendant of David according to the flesh in verse 3. The son of God in the Old Testament was human and resurrection is, strictly speaking, something that concerns a dead human being made alive again. So how does the resurrection declare Jesus to be the son of God, the descendant of Adam, Israel, and David? And uh, the answer... <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, sometimes I think I'm I'm just slow, and I I think that's right. I, I think you know sometimes I have to read something multiple times to to finally see what the 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 argument uh, to understand the argument. And um, earlier this week, I mean, I, I've read this section of this book. I, I said at the beginning, I think, you know, goals were, and I thought, this is a nice little short book. I, I'm sure I can digest this and explain it, and, you know, it won't be that difficult. And um, I, I think part of what's happening is that um, Goldsworthy should have taken another 100 pages um, to deal with people like me um, so that we could understand more clearly... <laughs> What he's, what he's arguing, but um, you know, the, after the third or fourth time that I had gone through this and, and you know, trying to understand his argument, I took actually took the book to bed, and I'm lying there, and I, and it's like, oh, you know, the, this light went off finally um, when he says this, um, and this was, I mean, he should have like had a heading over this section to or put it in italics or something so that I would have paid more attention to it. But he says, um, this doctrine of the resurrection uh, that is, clo is closely connected to the doctrine of creation and the renewal of the original creation in the new creation. So, when Paul says that he's declared to be the son of God by the resurrection, um, there's a connection in Paul's mind and uh, that you know, we're going to try to unpack here between um, the resurrection and the creation, new creation in the same way that there's a connection between Adam and the original creation, there's a connection between Christ and the new creation. And resurrection is the link um, that ties them together. And so,
And so that's why he focuses in, in his argument as he un, unpacks this, you know, how do we understand uh, the resurrection to, to be what declares Christ to be the Son of God and what does that mean? Um, he looks at how the development of the resurrection in the Old Testament. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to follow this argument. Um, so bear with me. We got what? 18 minutes. Um, so at, at the beginning here, this first quote that I put in here, uh, go back to that for a second. The pinnacle of the original creation is mankind with Adam as son of God, created in the image of God and after his likeness. The pattern of biblical history and the foreshadowing of the new heaven and the new earth are present in the original creation. The account of creation, therefore, is not only about the coming into existence of the physical universe and living things, it actually establishes the structure of the kingdom of God, God's people dwelling with God in the place he has prepared for them, submitting to his lordship and reflecting it in their dominion over creation. So we start with Adam, and um, Adam and Eve, uh, the, the testing of Adam carried with it a sanction for human disobedience. That precipitated the judgment. The human race brings death to the creation, and it is doomed to return to the dust from which it came except for Romans, uh, Genesis 3.15. The only hope is to be restored as part of a new creation. And so when you, in Genesis 3.15, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the promise that um, all is not lost. That there, there will be a restoration. Um, so what, what, what Goldsworthy is pointing to is this series of covenants that God makes with his people um, and how these ultimately bring us to Christ and, and bring us into the status with Christ of being sons of God. So there's Genesis 3.15, there's the covenant with Noah, which uh, reaffirms the promise that God will be gracious to a rebellious race. There's the covenant with Abraham that promises descendants and a land or a new Eden, uh, as Goldsworthy says, as their, as, uh, as their habitation. And so in just to, to stop and, and consider... Uh, the history of redemption as it relates to those things. Um, Goldsworthy points to uh, the enslavement of, e of Israel's children in Egypt, recalling the exile of Adam from Eden. Israel's redemptive exodus, uh, bringing about a kind of new creation. Um, and a, a, the land flowing when, with milk and honey is for um, sons of God to dwell in and to have dominion over, as in Eden. Uh, and and with, with the Abrahamic covenant, there's also a, a faithful obedience is, is part of um, the plan that God will reward faithful obedience, um, and, but disobedience brings deprivation, death, and destruction. So, you know, the, the, those parallels in, in the way that God deals with Adam and Eve and the new creation, the way that the covenant with Abraham is unfold, unfolds. Um, and so, last week we talked about Adam, um, Israel, um, and then ultimately David. So the focus goes uh, to a representative um, in 2 Samuel 7.14. 
I will be his father and he will be my son. A king who, who represents the nation. Um, so we said last week, when we got to this point, uh, Isaiah is writing and he's, he's prophesying judgments uh, which f follow in his lifetime. Uh, but he's also at the same time beginning to give uh, his readers an, th like the first indications that um, this coming son of David who is going to restore all things is, he's, he's son of David, but he is also, his, his, his lineage is divine. Um, I think we, we pointed you to um, Isaiah 9. Um, and I don't, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to go back there right now, but um, those, those promises... Uh, uh, Goldsworthy says the prophetic promises make it clear um, that this death of Israel in the exile is not the end the grace shown to Adam, Abraham and Israel in Egypt will one day be shown to the exiles in Babylon but the prophets envision a renewal of all things Specifically, the new creation includes a new heaven and a new earth, a new people consisting of the faithful remnant gathered from the lands of exile. So, um, we're, we're beginning to uh, be pointed to a God-man um, as the as the theme of resurrection also begins to unfold in the in in the Old Testament, um, and so I so he points to Isaiah fifty one three. Uh, For the Lord will comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. So there's, there's one, one passage that, uh, this is not long after this uh, first indication of the son of David having a divine lineage in, in Isaiah 9. This is Isaiah 51. Now there's an indication of, 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 a, um, of a renewal of all things of a perf, uh, perf, perfect, a restoration to perfection. Um, he points to uh, Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Be, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. So we have this glorious new creation that's, that's being um, pointed to uh, as part of and, and sort of in connection with the unfolding uh, of, of the idea of resurrection. So Goldsworthy, um, he, he, he cites this study by Patterson at length, but um, just to a, a few verses that Goldsworthy um, points to as part of the developing resurrection theme. Uh, well, first of all, he quotes Patterson. He says, antecedents of the Christian hope um, uh, of resurrection, let's see, he says, the growing resurrection vocabulary that flows from creation and restoration um, is there even when there is no clearly stated hope of general resurrection. Uh, but there are many clues to the emergence of the expectation of life after death. So the development of this theme of resurrection then, he, he points to... Um, First, Psalm 16, verses 10 and 11. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, 
nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life in your presence as fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Um, so you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Death will not be the end. <laughs> Um, there, there is, there is a beginning of this developing resurrection theme. Um, he points to Job 19, verses 25 and 27, um, where Job, where we read, <clears throat> "For I know that my Redeemer lives, and He shall stand at last on the earth. After my skin is destroyed, this I know." that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Um, and so, another, like, indication of, of resurrection. And, like, when does this happen exactly? We don't know exactly when Job was written, um, Patterson in his essay I'll, I'll post a link to this too in the Sunday School uh, channel um, says he, he believes it's in the patriarchal period um, um, but you know so the timeline um, not far p potentially uh, before Isaiah um, he quotes Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So again, um, my dead body shall, they shall arise. You, you, your dead shall live together with my dead body, they shall arise. I wanted to read to you what uh, Patterson says about that in his essay. Because he says this is really um, a pivotal turning point in terms of uh, our understanding of the doctrine of resurrection in the Old Testament. Um, he says in Isaiah 26 we see the first clear statement of the resurrection hope expressed in an eschatological direction first there is a description of the lords who have ruled over Yahweh's people instead of Yahweh himself um, then in verse 14 comes the statement the dead do not live Shades do not rise. The terms dead and shades here refer to human rulers who are no longer in the world of the living. And the, in the context, the writer is expressing his thankfulness that these dead rulers do not live or rise in the present world in order to trouble Yahweh's people. Uh, but then in verse 19, which we just read, a quite different future is envisioned for Yahweh's people themselves. Your dead shall live. My corpses shall rise. O dwellers in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a radiant dew, and the earth shall give birth to the shades. These verses are clearly eschatological. There are four different expressions depicting the idea of resurrection in the Hebrew text. It is a returning to life of the dead, a rising of dead bodies, an awakening of those dwelling in the dust, and the earth giving birth to the shades. Um, the dead are referred to as belonging to Yahweh, and this verse affirms that those who are, Yah are, are Yahweh's possession will not suffer death as their ultimate end. They will be resurrected to partake in the festivities of Yahweh's final triumph on the day he comes um, to judge. Um, he quote, Hassel, I don't know who Hassel is, but Patterson quote, quotes this guy and he says, 
this guy sees Isaiah's, Isaiah 26, 19 as being a pivotal part of the Isaiah apocalypse. The emphasis on resurrection is part of the interest in victory over death in the Isaiah apocalypse, the ultimate demonstration of the glory of God and his control over history comes to expression in Yahweh's act of resurrecting his faithful. This act reveals he has total control over life and death. I wish I had total control over the clock. Um, so, so Patterson's tracing the development of this doctrine concludes these two things. These are important. Uh, it has been seen that this broad resurrection hope is particularized in two different but related directions in prophetic eschatology. A hope for individual vindication beyond death in the world to come especially in Isaiah and Daniel and a hope for a return of the nation from the death of exile, especially in Hosea and Ezekiel. These hopes are intimate, intimately connected, but also operate independently of each other. So, so he's saying that in, in the Old Testament, as this the theme of resurrection develops, it's different writers are focused on different aspects of it. You know, sometimes it's the individual, sometimes it's the nation, but that they're uh, connected and he said, their hope, the, re the resurrection hope, which is found there, is grounded in creation, in the belief that the God who created life from the dust of the earth is able to bring life out of death. And so that brings us to Ezekiel 37. Um, Ezekiel 37, uh, verses 12 to 14. Um, this is uh, there's this is the passage about the dead bones being brought back to life. So in, the, in these verses um, is, is a kind of an explanation of what that whole picture earlier in chapter 37 was about. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Uh, the context here is, is the, is the uh, uh, return from exile of Israel, is exiled to Babylon. Um, but it is also pointing to our own exile from the captivity of sin. Um, and it, you know, it's interesting when you read some of the commentaries on some of these older passages, like Matthew Henry and John Gill, they're often saying, you know, these are types and shadows of things to come. So they were biblical theologians too. Um, Gill says of this, of this passage, this is both an emblem of the resurrection of the dead at the last day when they, sh so he, it's an emblem of, the, of our resurrection is what he's saying. It, uh, it, he's saying it's an emblem of the resurrection both of uh, the resurrection to eternal life or the resurrection to eternal condemnation. This is both an emblem of the resurrection of the dead at the last day when they shall come forth out of their graves at the voice of Christ, some to the resurrection of life and others to the resurrection of damnation and of dead sinners raised out of the graves of sin by the power and efficacy of the grace of God. So um, Goldsworthy picks up on this theme uh, from, from Ezekiel um, 37 and he says God promises that he will raise people from their graves and put his spirit within them 
It is impossible, Goldsworthy says, not to link this with Paul's reference to Jesus being declared the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So, so, so in, in, in Christ being identified as Son of God, he is fulfilling all of these prophecies of, uh, that relate to uh, personal as well as national re uh, uh, resurrection. Um, and, and he says this, um, Israel, the son of God given new life at the exodus from Egypt becomes the corporate reality represented by the son of God who is the son of David. Restoration from the death of exile foreshadows the bodily resurrection of the son of God. Did you ever make that connection before? Restoration from the death of exile foreshadows the bodily resurrection of the son of God. His resurrection combines the national and personal elements foreshadowed in the Old Testament. These promises include the gracious work of the Spirit to breathe new life into God's people. It is this resurrection life that declares Jesus to be the Son of God. Um, and because of his resurrection and because of our union by faith with him, um, we become sons of God. Uh, Sproul said this, the good news of the gospel tells us that we can be the true Israel of God as well. If we are in Christ, we share the privileges and relationship he enjoys as God's true son. We are not sons of God by nature, rather we are sons of God by adoption, his beloved children in Christ. As such, we inherit all the promises given to old covenant Israel, these promises of God that Israel would rule over her enemies and enjoy abundant covenant blessings. Those promises are for all of God's people, the true Israel of God consisting of Jews and Gentiles who are united to Christ by faith alone. In him, we are the true Israel of God, heirs of the glorious destiny promised to God's old covenant people. Amen. It's just amazing. Um, and there's so much more to, like, uh, uh, um, consider. Uh, um, I'm not sure that I could have covered it in one more lesson, even. But uh, at least I hope you've gotten an idea of how the, how the theme of the Son of God, you know, is developed from... Uh, Genesis through the New Testament and into our own lives um, and how God has um, worked uh, throughout history to show us the, the way that um, he um, is restoring us to an ultimately uh, glorified eternity with him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you um, for these glorious truths that um, we see unfolding in the history of redemption and for the um, just amazing privilege of having been adopted um, as sons of God. Um, I think of the um, so many people in the world who are um, alienated from you and just ignorant of um, the promises that uh, you've made and that you've kept um, and that you have for us and um, 
think of John 1, 12, and as many as received him, he gave the privilege of being called children of God. And um, the promises that you make to us to meet our needs and to care for us, to love us, um, um, they're just so uh, amazing and we're so grateful. And um, we just have this treasure um, that we want to make known to the world. Help us to do that. Help us, Lord, give us wisdom about um, how to um, help all the people who are ignorant of these things come to know them. In Jesus' name, amen.